Welcome to Feisty Chess. We have black after many times uh, playing white. Let's go full screen here. Um, E4 has been played. Um, I just played against the Alakine's defense. Uh, what do we want to play that hasn't been played much yet? Let's, let's go into a French. Try to redeem this French defense of mine. <clears throat> I'm just a little bit tired of uh, E4, E5. Actually, I'm not tired of it, but I just want a little more variety. Advanced variation. Okay, this is the simple French. You, uh, you want to push C5. System here is to go knight C6 and follow up with queen B6 just to get some pressure on D4. Okay, there's the, the trap. If I take... Yeah, I'll go bishop D7 here in the interest of time. <clears throat> if I were to take on D4 there um, and try to win a pawn and C takes, C takes, knight takes, knight takes, queen takes, bishop b5 check, wins my queen. Okay. So, um, this is allowing me, this is the Milner Berry Gambit. <clears throat> I can grab that pawn. I know better than to grab the second pawn, however. Um, I'm sure white wants me to do this. Let's go ahead and grab. Yeah, we're going to grab once, and now there's no more check, so my queen isn't hanging. He wants me to take that second pawn, but I know better than to do that. I like to think I do, anyway. But what do I do? That's the question. I know queen takes e5 is not a wise move, because then the rook comes, and there's pins, and I'm losing that d5 pawn. But the pawn I've got is very valuable. <clears throat> Uh, he doesn't have knight to a4, at least not without bishop takes. We just knight to e7 here. That actually sort of makes a threat to win that pawn. Knight to e7, I can come to c6 or g6 or even f5. I don't see any... <clears throat> hmm. Okay, he's got knight b5. He's got knight b5, and if I capture, then I can't capture because then I lose my queen. So we do need to do something about that. Rook to c8 seems to make sense. <clears throat> he has knight to b5, but then after, say, queen to b6, his knight doesn't seem quite well placed there. Yeah, rook, rook c8, where I could, I could just move my queen now. I kind of like the idea of making him play knight, knight to b5. He goes bishop e3, I've got... Well, that loses the a-pawn. Okay, bishop e3 would win the a-pawn if I go rook c8 right now. <clears throat> but I might be able to take on e5 instead. That doesn't look very comfortable. Bishop c5 right now definitely runs into knight b5. Although I could take then. Knight b6, sorry, queen b6, knight a4. And it's not a good idea to take that knight. Because the queen comes in with check. I also just have a6. That might be the main move here. And then there's a home for my queen on a7. Sad as that looks. a6, bishop e3. Maybe I can just simply take on e5 then. That doesn't feel right.
He gets a bishop to b6 in some of those lines. Hmm. A6 doesn't look too bad. Is it a mistake to play that here? Bishop e3. I don't have to take. I could go queen b4. <clears throat> and I'm hitting b2. Not really threatening it, though. I think a6 is the move. This is half based on memory. <clears throat> He guards his pawn now. Okay. Now maybe knight solve my problems enough to play knight to e7. I like the look of queen b6 here. I could actually take if he goes knight a4. Yeah, queen b6. And if he goes... I don't know. He could still go bishop e3, but I've got options. I never introduced my opponent. Um, Linterna Verde, WYD. Rated 2138. <clears throat> Actually, Bishop E3 runs into D4 now, doesn't it? Mm, that'll lose the D4 pawn after, after Knight. I don't think it's complicated. But, Bishop e3, d4, knight a4, queen a5, queen b4 is better. <clears throat> yeah, and I'm on two of his pieces. I don't see a, see a way out for him. So bishop e3 might, might be a trap at this point. If he goes bishop g5, I'm considering just bishop e7, hoping to trade some pieces. He does have queen g4. Maybe getting my knight out to e7 first in that case. Oh, my ideas are bringing a rook to c8. Um, bishop to b4. I don't think I need to think about trading off my bishop for his knight. That's my good bishop. Should bishop b5 is an idea for me here to trade my bad bishop off. But that would ruin my structure, but it would activate my rook after a something like knight takes. A takes. Okay. Queen f3. Guards over f2. <clears throat> I like the look of a knight on g6, or even c6 here. Yeah, knight on c6. Let's get that knight to e7. I don't see a reason not to.
we're hanging onto our pawn. We're improving our position. We're still behind in development. Knight f5 is really out of the question. It has been for a while, I think, really. The queen also interferes with a future f4 if black should want to support that e pawn. So that might be a, a little bit of an overextension that might be vulnerable. But actually at this point I don't need to think, nice thing about grabbing a pawn, I don't need to think about um, ways to go after weaknesses to win material. Um, simplifying should be enough for an advantageous endgame. <clears throat> Actually, I'm, I'm liking the look of that bishop to b4. Uh, activating that bishop further and encouraging some trades. Trading my, probably, like me, like me, likely my worst piece, the bishop on d7, just because it's so hampered by my own pawns. <clears throat> I'm sure he'd really like to get another attacker on f7. Because it'll take me a couple moves to defend f7, but I just don't see a way for him to do that. He's got a lot of pieces pointing at the king side. But I could still castle king side with maybe knight g6, bishop e7, and castles. And my knight can't occupy f6, but it could maybe get to f8 under the right circumstances. Queen c7 might be a good idea, and then uh, knight to g6 or c6 would come with a threat on e5. If he goes bishop f4, I think that invites knight to g6. <clears throat> Wouldn't mind trading that knight for, for his bishop, even his dark square bishop. Okay. a3. Now looks like a good time for queen c7. This is a flexible move. Well, my queen could be... He could oppose a rook to that queen in the future. So maybe we ought to decide on our knight first. Where's this guy going? I need some more help on the king side, I think. I like the look of knight g6. <clears throat> okay, we're pressuring e5. Preventing h4 for the time being. And readying the development of our king bishop. Huzzah! And I can actually meet bishop f3 with bishop c5 now. And he's going to prevent that. Okay. <clears> hmm. <throat> now looks like a really good time for... Bishop b5? Bishop e7 is another move to consider. I'm holding off on rook c8 because I just might want to castle on the queen side. Odd as that would seem. I think it would just take one move to get my king pretty much to safety. Um, Bishop e7 looks like the most flexible move here. What about bishop takes b4? It's just a takes, queen takes. I've got three pawns for the piece. I'm on his knight. He moves the knight somewhere. Say e2. I don't see any follow-ups. Ooh, knight. No, I can't go to c3, obviously. That'd be a interesting idea, but... Maybe rook c8 now. Maybe I need to give up on this idea of castling queenside. I don't think anything is to be gained from that. Rook c8. Make him either defend that knight or move it. Ahem. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> okay. Committed to rook c8. We're not castling queenside. Probably that was a bad idea. The castling queenside idea anyway. And for now, he's held off from advancing any, um, any more queenside pawns. Queen d4 is an idea here, interestingly. Queen d4, and then maybe once his knight moves somewhere, I don't see... He goes to a4. Then I might have queen f4, threatening to exchange queens. I think that works. Looks a little bit risky. Looks a lot risky, honestly. The knight comes to a4, most likely, to guard that bishop and unleash that attack on my queen. Then queen f4. Uh, let's look at the forcing line. Queen takes queen, knight takes queen, knight b6, rook c7. Or heck, honestly, rook, rook c6. I don't mind losing my castling privileges at that point. <clears throat> queen... Queen e5. If he goes knight e1, then that's just a sad knight on the first rank. All right. <clears throat> he doesn't have rook e4. I'd like to get my queen on the on the king side here. It feels like I should be castling first. Or at least getting closer to castling. Okay. Bishop e7 really seems called for. I'll keep the queen d4 idea in mind. <clears throat> okay, 15 moves, and I've got six minutes left on my clock. I've had to be careful to make the right kind of moves. Oh, he could win a pawn back with that queen f4 idea, couldn't he? Yeah, bishop takes, even after a castle. Um, so say I get my queen to f4, he's got bishop takes g6, then I need to trade queens on f3. But in the meantime, he can grab a pawn with either bishop takes f7, or if I castle, even bishop takes h7 check. Um, and then recapture on f3 with his pawn. He'd have a busted pawn structure, but he would, he could bust mine up a little bit too. Um, but I'd lose my pawn advantage. So maybe that's not the best idea, as long as my king is on a light square. Okay. Okay, now it looks like the time to castle. Or maybe, maybe I just bug that rook with bishop g5. The bishop's not doing much on the current diagonal. So bishop g5. And that could actually make, make this queen g4 idea more appealing. Queen f4. Okay, bishop, bishop g5. <clears throat> Okay, trying to survive the Milner-Berry Gambit here with uh, two times time odds. Linterna Verde now just going under 10 minutes. I also have ideas of Bishop F4, although no, that doesn't work as long as this Bishop can chop off my Knight. <clears throat> looking at ways of putting more pressure on that E pawn. 
I also have ideas of F6 after I castle, actually. I like the looks of that. I have to be aware of knight sacrifices on d5 to open things up while my king is in the middle especially, but I don't see much working. My, my queen guards the third rank. And let's see, right now knight takes d5. Um, he takes d5, queen takes d5. I could swap off rooks before playing queen e6. Hmm, that would allow him a third pawn. Okay, he's staying on the C file. <clears throat> okay, if I go queen d5 now, he's got knight b4. Sorry, queen d4, he's got knight b5. So that plan doesn't look so good. Maybe that's doable once I've played, once I've castled. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and castle. Get our last rook coordinated into the game. <clears throat> it's a good diagonal for our bishop. I could spring d4 on him whenever I'd like as well, and then swap off rooks. And then I have the C file, as well as bishop is on C2. Hmm. D4. Force a trade of rooks, and then I could trade off queens. But the problem is he's going to get my, my D pawn. He played G6, G3. Okay, he's planning on H5. Mm, D4, though, and we can really get that bishop, that light square bishop activated. He's made a pretty big hole on his king side. <clears throat> or maybe we just... Yeah, since his rook is on C2, I can force the exchange of, um, of light square bishops here. Alright, I like that idea. We need to start simplifying and taking that bishop off. That bishop is his best piece on d3, so let's let's trade that baby off. I don't mind doubling my pawns, because he's got a weak a-pawn. And yeah, I might be I might be creating a weakness there. But to try to go over that weakness, he'd have to give me the C file, wouldn't he? Okay. Do we trade off rooks first? Make him recapture with the bishop? Yeah, I think so. I think so. He doesn't have any in-betweensies with the knight. Could go bishop d4. I think I just... No, that... That just loses material to queen c6. So after I take here, he needs to recapture. And then I have the choice of taking back the knight with my queen. Or my rook. Sorry, or my pawn. He can't get to c1 with his rook. So, not for now anyway.
he would be able to target that weakness. I'm going to go ahead and take with the queen. Keep my structure intact. I mean, he's got the light square bishop, so he can grab whenever he wants. I did give him the bishop pair here. Okay, okay, he wants to go into an endgame. That's fine with me. I will have the C file, and I'd much rather play an endgame at this time control. Okay. <clears throat> now we can go F4. I see. That's the point. Bring the bishop here. We've got to check if we need it. going to have to trade rooks. We've gotten rid of our bad bishop here. So I like this ending for us. Hmm. Let's keep things compact over here, bring our knight into the game. Knight looks like it wants to get to C. Excuse me, c4. The best way to do that is maybe be a, via the b6 square. So let's go knight f8. Okay. This move threatens to trade off bishops now, and I can. So I'll have a knight versus bishop with an extra pawn in the ending. I am happy about this. <clears throat> Oof. I think, okay, this is calculation time, because I if I go knight c5, knight c4 right now, he has to take. <coughs> and then pawn takes. And my king is a little out of position, but I don't see how he deals with all my pawns on the queen side. I can, I can protect that pawn with b5, even if he plays a4. If he plays b5, so after here, and let's say king d4, make these moves. Oops. I'm not fast enough with that yet. Let's let's try this. Here we go. Take. Take. King d4. That just wins. Because there's no way he can advance his king without allowing my c-pawn to run. Um, if he plays instead of king d4, if he goes here, I just take. And yeah, this is, this is the one... This is the one king and pawn ending. My king is a little out of position, but he can't make any pass pawns, and I automatically have one. If he doesn't take, I just grab his a pawn and go up two pawns. <clears throat> okay. So he can never bring his king to the fifth, to his fifth rank because I have a protected pass pawn, and that's my extra pawn. So. The extra pawn is going to win the day here. So yeah, white made a lot of um, simplifying moves and allowed me to simplify, especially especially playing king f2, allowing me to take off the dark square bishops. Um, his two bishops were looking pretty nice as compensation for the pawn. And he was getting his king into the game, but it didn't really matter. I don't have to respond to this. Actually, taking would be a mistake because my king is out of position. I, yeah, I can always just recapture with my pawn. And it's the same, the same scenario here. My pawns are very happy. My king is going to join them shortly. He might try to push on the king side. There might be some kind of prophylactic moves I want to make to prevent him from having some kind of breakthrough on the king side. Um, g6. Maybe a simple way to do that. He, again, he can never invade with his king because I've got a C pawn that will run. <clears throat> so 
think about making a pawn move like that in the future here. <clears throat> okay, I think g6 pretty much shuts down any, any kind of breakthrough ideas he has at this point. Let's just get that in. <clears throat> that may not be necessary, but there's no sense in... in um, There's no sense in spoiling over that now. I may have to take on a5 at some point just to make my advantage felt. Let's get our king to c6, and he's probably going to go king e4. At which point I might just be able to push my pawn. Or no, if he goes king e4, okay. He's going to lock things up on that side. Probably I'll have to play c3 to get my king involved. Hmm. h5 would run into g5. h6 leaves my options open. I can wait with my king because he can, again, he can never come forward with his. So I can kind of triangulate this position if it does lock up. Let's go with h6. <clears throat> if he goes g5, I'll just play h5, and he's going to have to back his king up. he goes h5, I have to take it. I should take it, I think. Mm. Actually, it might not be the best to take it. I could make another passer. Okay. So this buys my way in if I go with c3 now. He has to play king d3, and then my king comes at e4, and if he takes, I get my king to e4, which should be the end of the game. Let me just make sure. Here, 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 here. King e4. I don't see any tricks. Let's do it. That also adds a little time to our clock to make a series of force moves. Oh, interesting. Okay, he's just gonna let me win on the queen side. King e4 might still be the best move here. Yeah, that looks like the simplest win. Let's just go for it. <clears throat> Take my c pawn, please. Just keep gobbling pawns. I should win any race here. I should. I can get a pawn, I can queen a pawn on h1. So here's the way to do it. After he takes, I can just push. Every tempo is critical here. So let's just get rolling. And if he pushes here, I've always got... If he tries to bring his king here, I might take this pawn so I can guard my base of my pawn chain. And his king is out of position to make headway on the, on the queen side pawns. Maybe this wasn't the simpler win. 
tough to make these decisions with so little time on your clock. <coughs> okay, he's going for it. Yeah, I should be able to watch over the a7 square. If he wants to try to guard it with his king, he's going to have to put his king in check on a queen. Okay. Yeah, just simply putting the queen here, and he's got a long way to go to make progress. In the meantime, I'm just going to come straight for the e-pawn and get my king involved. I could have picked up the g-pawn on my way, but he could get to d6. I mean, I should have an easy win at this point, but I do need to be careful. Okay. I'll just grab this pawn. Actually, I should have a mate here if I'm careful about this. I'll need to come back to, now he needs to step in front of the pawn, and yeah, I should be able to bring my king in for some kind of a mate. There's no stalemates because he's got that pawn. Yeah, queen here, check, and after king c6, he's getting mated next move. One extra move. Okay. Feel good about that game. Quality game. I survived the Milner Berry Gambit. Um, I don't know how sound that Gambit is, but <laughs> that's not really the point. The point is, it's, uh, it's a 15 10 game, and neither of us is a Grandmaster. So, the Milner Berry is a dangerous weapon. And it's really important to know these ideas. I mean, the Milderberry is one example of many. Whereas, if, if you're black, it's sometimes okay to take the first pawn that's gambited, but the second pawn is usually too dangerous. And the Milderberry is one example of that. So, let's uh, let's go to the analysis board. Thank you for the game, Lin Linterna Verde, WYD. And let's look at it. Okay, so my, my old French defense still has something to it here. So the advanced variation. The whole point, the whole theme of the French defense, especially the advanced variation, is hanging on to that d4 strong point that White tries to set up, because that's the anchor for his e5 pawn. Um, in some lines, White can play f4 here. That doesn't score very well in this particular variation. Um, so white played the main moves, knight f3. Bishop d7 is actually more often played here immediately, keeping the queen flexible, because you're going to want the bishop on d7. Um, so again, this is that trap. It looks like I can win this. Very common French defense theme, and if you're going to play the French defense, this is the first thing you need to know. You cannot win this d4 pawn when there is bishop e5 check, and your queen is going bye-bye next move. Actually, <laughs> not next move, because white, because black can also displace your king and then take your queen. So, either way, just plain losing. So that's the reason for bishop d7, which actually does make that threat a reality. And when white castles, uh, d takes c5, you'll see here is um, the main move, but castling is the other. Let's see, what, what's d takes c5 called? I don't know what the name is here. Uh, we're not getting that. But um, 
it's another way to play this position. Just give up, ultimately, on d4. Uh, the Milner Berry Gambit is another way of giving up on d4, castling. So I can take the pawn here, and I'm okay because my bishop is on d7. But white gets a lot of initiative, <clears throat> and he's going to chase that queen around some. And if you take, it looks very tempting to take this second pawn, but you're not ultimately going up a second pawn. Um, you'll see that among, hold on, it's white's move here, sorry. I'm going to master games. Um, okay. The second most common move is to take the pawn. I was able to find the common move, the most common move, a6 here. It took me several minutes, but we got there. But if, if black takes this pawn, uh, rookie one, we'll look at some of the lines here, and um, queen to d6, queen b8 might, might be the better move, but it looks awfully passive. But the point is, the knight's not coming to b5 with any kind of tempo on the queen. But uh, you're also just giving, back, giving up on the d-pawn here, because that, that e-pawn is pinned. If queen to d6 trying to hang on to that pawn, uh, knight b5 instead. And it's not a good idea to take, because then you'll be forced to move your king after the bishop check. Um, queen b6. And now bishop e3. This stuff is starting to sting a bit. Queen a5. Looks like black is doing okay here. It's mostly draws, but black has a hard time winning here. It looks like there's, there's repetitions. Anyway, um, black has two pieces out. White is castled and has all but one of his pieces out. Um, all for the low, low price of two center pawns. But this is a very dynamic position, a very open position, and I'd much rather... I don't know, I'd rather be white here. Maybe that's my style. So taking that second pawn is dangerous, and as the game showed, one pawn is enough if you just play carefully the rest of the game. So a6 is the main move, um, about four or five times as common as uh, queen takes e5. a6, uh, let's see, the main move for white here is queen e2, um, giving that bishop more mobility so there's not the threat of exchanging queens. Rookie one is also a viable option, although white doesn't score well in that. Actually, white doesn't score too well in general here. Um, King h1, the idea of f4, I suppose. But I think black, white was concerned with, well, he could take the pawn the second time, and uh, on this move, so I better guard it. Um, I guess queen e2 does the same. Anyway, rookie one is probably not terrible, but the computer really likes black. The computer, of course, is very materialistic and is not playing a practical, it's not evaluating this on a practical play standpoint in terms of human chess players in a 15-minute game. So queen to b6. Knight e7 is the main move. I got a little, a little nervous of bishop e3 because I didn't want that bishop planted on b6. I guess queen b4 covers that, and I can go to a5 with the queen. So maybe that's not too much to be worried about. Uh, I lose a lot of my advantage on queen b6 from the computer perspective. So knight e7 is also the preferred computer move. Just get those pieces out. Bishop e3, yeah, queen takes e5 is what the computer likes. Rook c1, rook c8, queen b3 d4. We're giving up on the b-pawn, maybe. Looks like a very different line. So black still has an advantage, and queen f3 isn't the most accurate here. Rook to b1. What's the idea with rook b1? Rook b1, bishop c5, then queen f3. Hmm. Hard to say what's wrong with the initial queen, b th queen f3. 97, the move I found. Now it likes knight e2. With the idea of sliding the queen to g3. Okay, preventing uh, bishop, the bishop from moving. But that's only if I play knight to c6. a3 is kind of slow for white in this position, so the computer really doesn't like it. 
nearly a pawn loss in the evaluation after a3. Computer wants white to play bishop e3. I think he's doesn't need to be worried about this second pawn. Let's look at bishop e3. Queen takes b2. Well, rook e to c1. And then we're going to play rook b1 next move. Um, knight c6. So letting that happen. Rook b1. we got to go to a3 now. Rook takes b7. Yeah, I didn't want to go in for any of this. I wasn't really thinking about touching that b-pawn because of lines like this. The computer may like white better. Huh. <laughs> may like black better, I'm sorry. Um, but the extra pawn is not looking worth it exactly right here with the rook on the seventh and all that development. So, again, the computer evaluation is not the same as I should have done this in this particular context. Okay, a3, at least he had a plan here. He wanted to get his bishop on the long bag and all that made some sense. Maybe b3 immediately would have made more sense. Computer likes that slightly better. Okay, knight to g6. It does like knight g6 here instead of c6. Let's see the difference. Yeah, pretty good difference, okay. My thought was just to keep the knight on the king side as a possible defender because I was looking like I wanted to castle king side. Um, b4. Now queen d4. Okay, it did like this idea. I don't know if that's the right idea, but now queen d4. Bishop takes g6. Hmm. Activating my rook. I got queen h4 ideas. Can't say that I like this idea for um, for white. That's his best piece, that bishop. Anyway, I didn't go queen d4. I went rook c8, bishop b2. Likes bishop e7. Okay, I'm finding a lot of the good moves here. Yeah, it likes bishop g5 here. Um, bishop takes g6, it wants to, oh, that doesn't sacrifice the exchange. Anyway, now it's changed its mind. Bishop takes g6, though, it just gives me the h-file. I can still castle if I so choose, but I don't need to, because my rook is already activated. And you've traded off your good bishop, and this bishop is hampered by all sorts of pawns, especially this e5 pawn. to a4. Queen b5 and then rook takes c8. Okay. Slightly misplacing my pieces. But still black. Black has an advantage. Um, rook c2 is not quite right. Not castling. Queen g4. Yeah, this... This creates a hole. It likes bishop h6, just anticipating h4. Committing the bishop to that diagonal. Hmm. I want to stay more flexible. Okay, it doesn't like this idea of trading off my bad bishop. The computer always evaluates the bishop pair pretty highly. So... Yeah, but I was happy I found a way to do this without doubling my a pawns. I'll show you why in a second. Rook takes c2, bishop takes, and then queen takes b5. If I had gone this, I, b I bet this loses my advantage. Yeah, because white has an easy time doubling up on this, and I don't have an easy way to defend it. We can go h4 first, like he was planning, and kick my bishop. Apparently it's still worth keeping that bishop on this diagonal to keep the rook off of c1. That makes sense. But after queen... I don't know, queen d3 is what it's looking at. I'm looking at bishop c, bishop d3, and then queen e2. I can't defend that pawn a second time. So, that's why I was happy I found a way to, some tactics to, to take that bishop off the defense of the pawn so I could take with the queen. Although my edge here is very slight because I've now given white the bishop pair. 
But again, I'm not sure I would evaluate it the same way because, okay, after h4, let's look at this. I think queen d3 was a strategic error. So if instead h4, bishop d8, instead of e7, I would think e7 so I could still slide my rook to c8. But it really likes white here. Oh, wow, that's a big difference. What's what's the idea? Bishops, bishop e7, h5. Oh, of course, that knight is trapped. Okay, low on squares. The bishop has to go here. Ultimately, it'll have a better place to sit, say, on b6. But in the meantime, black gets kicked around a little bit. White can get his rook. Ooh. King G2, the idea of putting the rook on the on H file, maybe. Huh. Still got that pawn advantage, but my king side is looking pretty leery with both bishops staring down at it and my knight unclear on where to go. Hmm. I'm glad white didn't find that line. Queen F3, Queen D3. Um, I think a definite mistake when you're down a pawn, it's and you've got the space advantage, um, and you have the pot prospects for making a pawn storm with tempo on the king side, it's not the right move to trade queens. So I was happy to trade queens. Rook c8. And also really give him nothing better to do but to trade rooks. Bishop d8. King g2, just anticipating a check on the diagonal, the dark diagonal there. Doesn't like this. Well, this is not that bad, actually. Trading off the rooks. This might actually make the two bishops a little more powerful. I don't know, different players will tell you different things here, but... Okay. Now I figured out a plan for my knight. My plan was to go knight here, 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 and here. Actually, that worked out much quicker than I anticipated. So knight f8, okay, computer doesn't dislike that. Bishop there. And now is the threat to trade off. The computer wants e4, what about king to g2? And then he doesn't have to trade off that bishop pair. This is one compensating factor here. Although we've only traded off three pawns total. So that bishop pair, especially that light square bishop, is pretty stymied by my pawns, and his dark square bishop is stymied by his own pawns. So maybe it's not so bad to trade off those bishops for him. But nonetheless, it was a relief to be able to trade off these bishops. If not for the bishop pair, then at least just for the trading off of more pieces when I'm up a pawn. Yeah, probably a mistake to take there. You want to make me take so you can slide your king up to the third rank. Maybe something like a4, like the computer recommends. And then hmm, bishop to d8. It wants me to come back to d8. I'd probably play king f8 here. a5. It still wants bishop to d8. Why not this? Hmm, that king position is a big compensating factor. Well, that might have been true in the game. King gets up here, but now, yeah, knight c4 check is just winning. Uh, b5, trying to trade off some pawns. a5. Hmm. King e3 anyway. Oh, now, now this doesn't work out for black. I can't go knight c4 check, that would be the point of b5, because now I can never get a pawn of my own to b5. And he simply takes, and actually he's winning. Despite being down a pawn, that pawn is just temporary. He's going to gobble it up in a couple of moves, and his king is meanwhile going to have a much better position. Um, the computer is still thinking about whether this is winning or not. I, it's hard to say. These things are notoriously difficult to evaluate. 
and likes b6. You're, it wanted me to play b6 last move. Yeah, that's probably a good move. That builds a wall. King takes c4, h5, and this this must be a draw. Yeah. It's got to be a draw with best play. So he had a lot of time. Um, my opponent had a lot of time to think at this point. We're going in, I mean, this is a critical moment. We're going into an endgame, and king e3 is a very committal move because it allows me to forcibly bring about a pawn ending, um, which is one. So yeah, 1.7. I'm wondering if king d4 is even a better move here. Knight takes a3. And then his knight is kind of boxed in. Hmm, not really. Interesting. Now b6. And I can create a protected pass pawn. This creates a wall to stop his king from entering. If he tries this, I go here. And I've got, again, I've got the, still got my wall, and I've got a protected pass pawn that's going to easily win me the game. So, yeah, extra pawns, when they really count, is when you start dropping the material off the board. If I can force material off the board into a king and pawn ending, um, yeah, the computer valuation will probably just continue to go up here. It likes a4 better, but that should just transpose. The one continuation that looked a little murkier to me is this pawn sacrifice, but that's just too many pawns to go down. And uh, he can try to get his king in now, and maybe... He can never come here, because this pawn runs, right? I go here, maybe he's got this idea, but I can just take and... That is a winning pawn ending. You can't take my pawn, um, or my other pawn runs, and that's clearly an obvious win. Okay. I wonder if I executed this the right way. I was really low on time. Maybe I should have just stopped everything up on the king side. Once I noticed I could triangulate, For instance, here, I could basically force a lockup of the position. Let's see. This is still winning for me, but I wouldn't have known that at the time. Um, if he pushes to just lock things up, now I can push c3. If he takes, I have to take. Now he plays king d4. I've got king d7 to triangulate. This is important because his king can never step in front where my pawn runs. So he has to go. Hmm. Yeah, this is a case of triangulation, but only because he only has one square from which he can go to either e4 or d4. So. I have two squares from which I can go to c6. I need to be on c6 at the right time. I want to be on c6 um, and then make him go to e4. That's kind of happened in the game. I didn't need to do this, however. And I actually wasn't certain it was it was possible. But, but it is, so we'll watch this. King e4, and now king e8? I'm thinking king c7, that should do the trick. Ooh, king e3. Okay, no, it's not, a, it's not a case of triangulation. Man, you see these things in books and you really want them to come true in your games. <laughs> I've read enough endgame books that I'm still waiting for that case of triangulation over the board. But he can shuffle back and forth between e3 and e4 and only come to d4 when I, when I land on c6. 
But there's another winning method, apparently. Now I can just go around and, and try to plant my king on... In the, to work through in the king side. King e3. He just has to shuffle while my king takes a stroll here. King g8. I don't know why g8. Let's run with it. King f3, king g7, king e3, king g6. Now, yeah, if king here, then f6. Okay. I'm breaking down his wall. If he waits, I can just take. Is that right? F takes e5. He can't take with the king because I'm running. Uh, if he takes with the pawn, I get to invade and grab over here. Okay. That's not what happened in the game. <clears throat> I took my chance. I was expecting him to lock things up here. This gives me a choice to pass the move to him. Say like this, and then he's got this, and that would be similar to the game. But these pawns would be even more fixed and vulnerable. Uh, where are we here? If he goes here, I cannot go here. This is really important. Because now he has the out, look at that, look at that evaluation. He has got the outside pass pawn. So if he goes h5, I have to take. h5, take, take. But now we got that same scenario where I've got, you know, he's got to babysit this pawn full time. And I can just worm around maybe to e7 and get f6 in. And... Well, he's still got a wall there. What's the winning method here? King e4. King d8. King d4. King e7. King e3. f5. Okay. We're making him take, which would take down his wall. Or, now he doesn't have this waiting square. Oh, this is fascinating. Okay, if he takes, let's look at this. I simply take back, and now I can... He can go king e4, but now this should win easily. He's got he's to chase this pawn, and now I hunt down this pawn. I'll grab both of those pawns if I need to. But this, this pawn's a runner. Um, White's lost here. So we can't take, but if he doesn't take, now the triangulation works. King d7, king c3, and this technically isn't triangulation. Wait, king c7. Okay, so if this, he can come back here, and now I need to triangulate, but I still can. So b7 is one idea. He has to find himself on d4 after I play to c6. Otherwise, I'm coming into e4 next move. Sorry, d5 next move. But he can't, he can't play to d3 or e4 at any point, so he's got to go back and forth between these two squares or those two squares. And now king to c6, that can't be right. King to c2, and I'm getting in. See, if, if he goes here, then I come here, and now he's got to move. And king e2, I'm, I'm just invading and grabbing everything. So yeah, the timely f5. This would also work if he had played king e4 instead of king e3, critically. Uh, he still can't take here because it doesn't matter who's got the move. He's got to babysit this extra pawn. I'll win the c pawn um, in the game. And obviously not taking 
he's got to move his king off of that check, and the same, the same position arises. Okay, useful idea, illustrating some important themes. All right, so I was expecting one of those pawn pushes. He slid back instead and allowed me to sack this pawn. And now really interesting was king here. I probably should just go to c4, because then I'm, I mean this, I was worried about breakthroughs here. I was a little too paranoid about breakthroughs. But I've got thing, after g5 I've got h5, and after h I've got g takes. And after f5, I mean either of these captures should work. Hmm, it's complicated after f5. I take here, he recaptures, and I capture here. No, he doesn't have any breakthrough ideas at this point. Okay. Uh, I went with my original plan, however. King takes c3. But this was a race, and I just kind of intuitively felt, I didn't do any counting, I just felt that it's got to take him a lot of time to get his king down there and then march his pawn. And I knew that I could queen, it looked like I could queen on the on the long diagonal to guard against that a-pawn and take it if I needed to. Um, sack my queen and then make a new queen before he could. It wasn't too much risk here, but it always feels pretty risky. Um, that's why I didn't go for the h-pawn initially and instead just made sure I could get all the tempos that I could. I knew, I knew that this g-pawn wasn't a problem as long as I had this. Um, if he tries to play king e6 to make this more of a threat, for instance now he's threatening move here and then, and then take this and queen, I can simply take this. But again, I don't, even, I don't even know if that's a real threat. You'd have to count out the moves. I didn't have time for that. Um, okay. So he goes after my pawn. It might have been... I mean, he's just trying to get more pawns for it. Here. Here. And I'm hitting, hitting him with check. That's important. Yeah. So I had plenty of time on that race. But it's still a little bit nerve-wracking because I didn't have time to count that stuff out. And I could go for king takes g5 here, but it seems simpler to go after the e-pawn. It seemed better because then I had a pawn I could run if I needed. But honestly, I was just a little paranoid at this point. There's, there's no real concerns. And we're just getting our checkmate going. So there we go.